We're beginning a new unit on stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is meant to follow on the heels of our coverage of moles and balancing equations. We're going to start with the type of problem, a limiting reactant problem or a limiting reagent problem. As a preliminary note, I want to point out that throughout the rest of this video, I'm only going to refer to moles of reactants and moles of products. And that's because chemical substances react in rigid ratios. That's what we call stoichiometry, reacting in rigid ratios. But those rigid ratios are mole to mole ratios. However, many times problems will not give us moles of reactants. They'll give us grams of reactants, and then we're going to have to convert them to moles. And then we can go on and do the rest of the calculations for the problem. Here you see uh, what looks like a familiar balanced equation. This looks very similar to the balanced equation for cellular respiration that you learned in biology, except that here the glucose is solid and here the water is not liquid but gas. Down below I'm showing you structural formulas for the representing the same things that are represented in the balanced equation. Uh, and this is as if nature had given you exactly the perfect ratio of these things. For instance, one mole of glucose to react with exactly six moles of oxygen, then we would make, then nature would make exactly, or this reaction would make exactly six moles of carbon dioxide and six moles of water. Again, this, uh, the the meaning of this balanced equation is to show you what ha what was present before, and will be consumed if the reaction proceeds. And then what's present afterwards, which will be produced after all of these reactants have been consumed. So on the left side, we have reactants only, and that's what's shown here in structural form again, representing uh, each molecule representing one mole of the substance. In actual fact, you would expect uh, in nature for the oxygen molecules to be in the gas form, kind of randomly arranged, and the sugar molecule to be uh, a solid at the bottom because it's more dense and then what would actually be happening would be the things would be in motion and you see here we have an oxygen about to crash into a glucose molecule and then the action was paused but that's how the reaction would happen would be when this oxygen crashed into a glucose molecule and all the rest of the oxygens would also eventually have to crash into what's remaining of the glucose molecule to turn them all into products. Of course, after the reaction of such a perfect ratio of substances, such as one mole of glucose with six moles of oxygen, as portrayed on the previous slide, what would happen in nature would be that all of the oxygen and all the glucose would get used up to make six moles of carbon dioxide and six moles of water. They would be randomly arranged, they'd be in the gas phase, and they'd be in motion. If we tallied them all up, we'd still, you know, the others were in motion on the previous slide, but here they are all just lined up neatly as if we could organize them like that. Six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water representing six moles of carbon dioxide, six moles of water produced by the reaction of one mole of glucose and with six moles of oxygen. And my point in this slide is just to show you that we don't have both of these, the reactants and the products, present at the same time. The reactants get used up to form the products. So this is the after picture if you just tallied up and neatly arranged all the particles if you could control them like that. But as I've been alluding to thus far, the likelihood that nature would provide us exactly uh, perfect ratios of glucose to oxygen so that every bit of oxygen available would get used up and every bit of glucose available would get used up, that's pretty rare. So let's take a more realistic example and say, what if we start off with three moles, each, of course each molecule here is representing a mole, three moles of glucose, and let's see how many moles of oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we've got three moles of glucose with the possibility of reacting with 12 moles of oxygen. Now the problem here is that they can only react really in a one to six ratio. And this is not a one to six ratio. So here what I'm trying to do is contrast what the balanced equation tells us and what can really happen in nature. So remember reactants can only react in specified ratios and those are mole ratios such as in this case one to six. And the amounts available in nature may not match that 1 to 6 ratio, such as this 3 to 12 ratio here. So some reactant is going to run out first. That means we'll use it all up. It'll get all reacted, and there will still be some of the other reactant 
unreactant. So here we've portrayed in nice orderly arrangement the reactants on the left side of this equation what's available to react. We've got three moles of glucose and we have 12 moles of oxygen and the question is if there are three moles of glucose and 12 moles of oxygen available to react, will they all react? And again, we've said reactants only react in specified ratios. The amounts available may not match the mole ratio and some reactants will run out first. Can you tell which? So what I want to do now is present you with three different methods of figuring out which runs out first. And this is with a view toward eventually totaling up how much should be produced out of this reaction and how much will be left over of the original things that weren't able to react because uh, the other reactant ran out first. Here's method one, and it's the idea of it is to determine how many of the other reactant do we need. So I'm going to start with this reactant, which is glucose. I've got three moles of it, and I want to see how much of the oxygen that I have would I need to use up in order to react all three moles of glucose. In other words, if glucose was the limiting reagent, if it was what we were going to run out of, then how many moles of oxygen would we use up while we were running out of this glucose? So here we'll do a little bit of set up a t-chart. So if we're trying to use up three moles of glucose, we'll set up a t-chart and we'll say, well, the ratio in which they have to react with oxygens is six to one. And this is coming straight out of the balanced equation for the overall reaction. Uh, I use this ratio to convert from moles of glucose that I have to use up into moles of oxygen that I have to use up at the same time. And so we can see that to react all three moles of glucose, I'm going to have to use up at the same time 18 moles of oxygen. That should make sense because that's a six to one ratio, right? <clears throat> so, well, we actually have only 12 moles of oxygen available. Thus, some of the available glucose will not be consumed. Therefore, glucose is considered the excess reactant or reagent because some of it will be left over after reaction is complete. I hope that makes sense. We have three moles of glucose. To react it completely, we'd need 18 moles of oxygen, but we only have 12 moles. So we clearly can't react all of the glucose. So the glucose is not going to run out first. It is going to be in excess. There will be some of it left over, not used up, when the reaction's done. So what we're doing is this method, we're using the mole ratio from the balanced equation. That was our 6 to 1 ratio from the balanced equation. We're using that to calculate how much of the other reactant we'd need so as to use up all of this reactant, which in this case would have been 18 moles. And then whichever reactant requires less of the other reactant than is available is the limiting reactant. Well, this reactant requires more of the other reactant than is available. And so this is not the limiting reactant. And we'll go on and you would already have established this if you're working on your own problem. But I'm going to show you the other side of calculating this from the perspective of the other reactant. So here we are considering uh, the same method from the perspective of the other reactant. Now we'll start with just oxygen with the amount of available oxygen, which is 12 moles. We're trying to use up 12 moles of oxygen. And, and when we used up oxygen, we use, need to use it up in this ratio. For every six moles of oxygen that we use up, we need to use up one mole of glucose. That's what this balanced equation is saying, the coefficients from it. And so, if we're trying to use up 12 moles of oxygen, we will also need two moles of glucose. Well, that's interesting because we already have three moles of glucose available, which is more than what is required to completely react all of the available oxygen. Thus, all of the available oxygen will be consumed. Therefore, oxygen is considered the limiting re reactant or reagent because when all of it has reacted, the reaction must stop. It has to stop when we run out of oxygen. Actually, you know this about combustion reactions. If you can smother them so there's no more oxygen, it shuts off the reaction, right? In this case, the 12 moles of oxygen gas will be completely used up, and only two of the three moles of glucose will have been used up. Remember, we had three moles of glucose, but we only need two in order to react all this oxygen. So one mole of glucose will be left over that didn't get to react. It'll be unreacted. So... We, again, going back to the description of this method, we use the mole ratio from the balanced equation, which we did, to calculate how much of the other reactant we'd need to use 
so as to use up all of this reactant and we figured out that to use up 12 moles of oxygen we'd have to use up two moles of glucose and so whichever reactant requires less of the other reactant than is available is the limiting reactant. And again, we have three moles of glucose available, but we only need two moles of it in order to react this 12 moles of oxygen. Just want to show you a different way of depicting the products at the end. So we started off, remember, even though this is a one to six ratio, that's always going to be true when you balance that equation. We were given 3 moles of glucose, which is not the same as 1. We were given 12 moles of oxygen, which is not the same as 6, and not even the right ratio. So as we just discussed, all the oxygen is going to get used up, and uh, there's going to be a glucose left over. We said we had 3 moles of glucose to begin with, and we only needed 2 to react all the oxygen. So we have 1 mole of glucose sitting here as a solid down at the bottom in this depiction, unreacted. And then up here, let's see how many carbon dioxides. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we have twelve moles of carbon dioxide. And how many moles of water? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we got twelve CO2s and twelve H2Os, which is what you would expect to produce if. When you use up, if you use up 12, all of 12 oxygens reacting them with glucose, because notice when I use up six oxygen molecules, I make six CO2s and six H2O. So it makes sense if I use up 12 oxygens, I'm going to make 12 carbon dioxides and 12 waters. But why didn't we use up all three glucoses? Because the ratio in which they have to react with each other is one mole to six moles and we had three moles of glucose to begin with it only took two moles to react with the 12 moles of oxygen so just to do the tally in a nice neat way as if we had control over all these molecules here the 12 carbon dioxides and the 12 waters and the one glucose we've gone through method one to show you how to figure out which reactant is the limiting reactant and then also we've kind of showed you how much we didn't go through the process with the T-charts, but we've shown you how much product should have been made and how much of the reactants should be left over when the reaction is done. I've swung it over here on the right side as if this was all products. This is not a product, it's just an unreacted reactant. It's something that's going to be left over when the action is done. So we've covered one method for figuring out what the limiting reactant is and trying to figure out how much will be left over and so forth. Well, here's method two, how much product can we make? And we got the same sort of situation going on with the 12 oxygen molecules and the three glucose molecules, but we got a different procedure going on. I'm just gonna skip to the next slide in order to show you it in a different arrangement. So this is in the nice, pretty, tallied up as if we had control over the molecules kind of arrangement like we did previously. We're still talking about method two. And I'm gonna, and I've kind of set these over on the left side to represent reactants that are present before the reaction happens. Let's go on to the next slide to figure out what else should be going on here. Okay, so we've covered one method for how to uh, figure out how much product we can make based on how much reactant gets used up. And uh, I wanna give you a second method for doing this now. The way we're going to do it is we're going to use the mole ratio for the balanced equation to calculate how much product can be made. Whichever reactant can be used to make less product is the limiting reactant. So uh, we're going to start with one of the two reactants and make a little t-chart. So if we could use up three moles of glucose, our question is how much product can we make? And we're going to target carbon dioxide for when we consider each of these uh, reactants. We're going to try to see how much of the same product we could make starting with either one of them. So we're starting with the glucose, three moles of it, and we use a little t-chart and we look at the balanced equation. We see, oh, six moles of CO2 get formed when I use up one mole of glucose. That's what the balanced equation says. For every one mole of glucose I get used up, I'm going to make six moles of carbon dioxide. And so if we could use up three moles of glucose, we could make 18 moles of carbon dioxide. I hope the math is pretty obvious here. We multiplied across the top. We canceled off our matching units in numerator and denominator, and we just had three times six. So we got 18 moles of carbon dioxide. It's how much carbon dioxide we can make if we could use up all three moles of glucose. 
So now let's consider the oxygen. If we could use up all 12 moles of oxygen, well, what's the ratio in which they react to form carbon dioxide? From the balanced equation, when we used up six moles of oxygen, we make six moles of carbon dioxide. Here we go with our multiplication, our canceling of uh, matching units in numerator and denominator. You can see the sixes cancel each other, and we got 12 times one, basically. So if we use up all 12 moles of oxygen gas, we're going to make 12 moles of carbon dioxide. And uh, that's clearly less than 18 moles of carbon dioxide we could make if we could use up all the glucose. So clearly, we're not going to get to use up all the glucose, but we are going to use up all the oxygen. That's what this little statement is going to say. Oxygen is the limiting reactant because we only have enough of it to make 12 moles of CO2 if we use up all of the O2. In contrast, if we could react all of the glucose, we would be able to produce more moles of the same product. So all of the O2 will get used up, but not all of the glucose will. And that's it. So we just followed these procedures. We use the mole ratio from the balanced equation in these little uh, fractions here. Those, those uh, numbers in the numerator and denominator and their units came from the balanced equation. And we used them to calculate how much product could be made. So we converted the available amount of stuff into how much product we could make using the mole ratio from the balanced equation. And since uh, this one, since the oxygen nets out to less produced carbon dioxide in oxygen, O2, must be the limiting reactant. So here we go with method three, which, which I just say is means divide by the coefficient. Now this is my favorite way to do this, but I've provided all three methods for you in case one of the others makes more sense to you. So what I'm saying here is we're going to use the coefficient from the balanced equation, of course, again, and we're going to divide the available number of moles by the coefficient for that reactant. So if I'm talking about how many moles of this reactant I have, I'm going to divide it by 1. If I'm talking about how many moles of this reactant I have, I'm going to divide it by 6. Now, again, I'm showing you we got the 3 moles. We're still on the same problem. 3 moles of glucose with 12 moles of oxygen which is readily portrayed in nice, neat fashion here, as if we could organize all these molecules and stack them up so nice and neatly. So now let's get to the actual method. So we're going to start with moles available of one reactant. Let's pick glucose. There are three moles of glucose available. Now that three didn't come from this balanced equation. It's what we have available in the lab or in nature, right? And what are we going to do with it? We're going to divide the available number of moles by the coefficient for that reactant. And the coefficient for that reactant for glucose is 1. And so we're going to say, well, <clears throat> I just get this 3 here for my uh, glucose. I'm worried about the 3 to compare against what goes on when I do the same process with oxygen. So let's do the same process with oxygen. My moles available for oxygen are 12, and I've got to divide it by the coefficient from the balanced equation for that reactant. So here we go. Got 6 is the coefficient on oxygen from the balanced equation. So obviously, this comes out to a 2. My 2 is smaller than my 3. So and again, this result agrees in principle with the last two methods results, which is to say oxygen is the limiting reactant. The reactant with the smallest quotient is the limiting reactant. This little 3 and this little 2, they're just quotients, OK? So. When we divide them by their coefficients, we kind of level the playing field between them, right? If i got to use six of these when I use one of those, and I divide this one by the one and that one by the six, I'm normalizing them. I'm leveling the playing field. So since the normalized quotient for O2 is less than that for glucose, then O2 must be the limiting reactant. Now, to calculate the amount of product formed or the amount of excess reactant consumed, I would start a T-chart with the original number of moles of limiting reactants. So I'd have to start a new T-chart. This is not really a T-chart here. I would start a new T-chart with 12 moles of O2, and then I'd go and calculate how much product I could make starting with that 12, that 12 moles, which is kind of like doing method two, right? So now for a brief consideration of the benefits of the various methods here. There are three methods here. So on method one, you remember, we were uh, taking the moles of a reactant and using the mole ratio to find out how many moles of the other reactant we would need in order to react this reactant completely. And if we have less of the other reactant than we need, then the other reactant must be limiting. And we would be done figuring out who's limiting by that point, right? And then we could just start 
our calculation with the number of moles of the other reactant. Or if we do that one calculation and we come out showing that the moles we need in order to completely react this reactant are less than how many we have of the other reactant, then the reactant we're calculating with uh, is the limiting reactant. We can use those number of moles to do to calculate moles of product. With method two, the benefit of it is that when you're done, you've already calculated how much of one of the products will be formed, but you'll have done it the calculation twice. It's just that one of your answers will already tell you uh, how much the, the particular product you've targeted you've made. And so that could be a benefit, except that you've had to do the calculation twice. And method three, which happens to be my favorite, but I totally understand if you don't, if it's not yours, is that it's really simple math up front. And then, of course, I go back and take my original number of moles of the limiting reactant and basically do the T chart I would have done for method two if I, if I need to figure out moles of product. So there you have it. There's, of course, more to come.